Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? The late 1990s saw a big increase in the popularity of laptops, as well as the rapid evolution of handheld, personal digital assistants. Each had its own strengths and weaknesses, so in 1998, Microsoft tried to capitalize on the best features of both. Sharp's PV6000, also known as the Mobileon Tripad, was a device meant to create a new market. Folded up, it resembled a laptop, but opening it revealed a much more flexible arrangement of parts. The display was double hinged to reveal a keyboard in the base, and it could be used like an ordinary notebook. But that display could also flip around to put the device in tablet mode. And in either setup, instead of a mouse, one used a passive stylus on the tripod's resistive touchscreen. Connectivity was pretty limited. The left side featured an infrared transceiver, modem jack, special dock connector port, and the DC power input. The right side was even more sparse, with just a Type 2 PC card slot. And that was it. No USB, no parallel, no way to connect even an external keyboard or mouse. This was entirely intentional, because this wasn't meant to be a traditional Windows 98 laptop. In fact, it didn't even run Windows 98 at all. Instead, it used Windows CE. The tripad was one of the first so-called handheld PC professional devices. This platform was more commonly known at the time as Jupiter by its internal Microsoft codename, and it was a big change from previous Windows CE products. Most of those were palm-sized devices, with Hewlett-Packard's models perhaps being the most recognizable, though other manufacturers, including Sharp, produced them. Their small size made them very pocketable, but also difficult to be productive with. Laptops, by comparison, were much more useful given their larger screens and dramatically more comfortable keyboards. But they were sometimes a burden to carry around, and their prices were off-putting to some buyers. Jupiter devices were designed to straddle the line between PDAs and notebooks, offering a more traditional form factor while prioritizing lightweight and long battery life. Sharp's tripod was one of the first of these machines. Except Sharp didn't actually design it. Instead, it was licensed from a company called Vatum, who up to that point had been a manufacturer of mobile device components. Vatum's Clio was its first consumer product, and along with the otherwise identical tripod, made a bit of a splash in the tech news circles when it launched in late 1998. Initial blurbs about the pair were positive. The promise of a laptop-like device with a battery life of 12 hours or more was already appealing, but their other features were, to some, downright amazing. 9.5 inch color LCD, touch typable keyboard, a thickness of less than an inch or about 3 centimeters, and a weight of 3.5 pounds or 1.5 kilograms. Those last two figures were at least half that of a mainstream laptop at the time, and the list price of $1,000 US was a sizable chunk smaller, too. But looks, as they say, can be deceiving, and the long-term reviews weren't quite so rosy. Common complaints were centered around the display, which didn't get very bright and had a washed-out look. It was also slow. Windows CE devices usually relied on low-power, reduced-instruction-set CPUs instead of the typical processors from Intel or AMD. But the Clio and Tripad relied on a chip from NEC that was clocked at only 84 MHz. The inclusion of an almost full-size keyboard was a major benefit. Key feel was decent, though not exceptional, as it was of the rubber dome variety. But its curved design had a mixed reception. Some found it perfectly usable, while others said that they would inadvertently miss keys or hit the wrong ones. Storage was another concern. The machines shipped with 16 megabytes of RAM, which in and of itself wasn't horrible for the time. 
but like most CE devices, the RAM also needed to double as user file storage. Out of the box, they came with 24 megabytes of ROM, but that was reserved for the OS and pre-installed apps, and wasn't able to be written to. So users had to choose how much RAM they wanted to reserve for their files, versus any additional applications they wanted to install and use. This was a typical arrangement with PDAs at the time, as flash memory was fairly expensive. It also came with some risk. Since RAM required constant power to retain its contents, one needed to be mindful of the status of the backup battery. Thankfully, there was a control panel where you could keep an eye on it. If 16 megabytes wasn't enough, one could spring for the 32 megabyte RAM expansion option, and there was also a compact flash card slot hidden in the battery compartment. But either of these, of course, came at additional expense. A major benefit to the use of solid-state storage, though, was that the machine never needed to be fully shut down. Instead, it would simply be put into standby mode, and waking it up again was very quick, just a couple of seconds. There does seem to be some kind of bug related to standby and the touchscreen on at least this unit, as waking it up causes the stylus calibration to go out of whack. It's hard to say whether all of these suffered from this problem, but one review did mention touchscreen responsiveness problems, so it's possible that others had to deal with it too. The biggest issue, though, wasn't one specific to this hardware. The catch to Microsoft's promise of lightweight, efficient laptops was Windows CE itself. Its feature set was dramatically trimmed down from the main Windows product line, and while it came with the Office suite, all the apps were limited in what they could do. Basic word processing and spreadsheets were no problem, but PowerPoint didn't allow for creating new presentations only viewing them and making minor edits. Jupyter devices also supported handwriting recognition, but what you could do with it was equally limited. Synchronizing files with a PC then was a common occurrence, yet a cumbersome one. Unless you spent extra for a network PC card, you were stuck using either infrared or the serial port cable to connect directly to a host PC. Due to the machine's thin profile, this meant hooking up the travel dock, which was really just a DE9 adapter with a pass-through power socket. In some cases, it would have been easier to simply email yourself any files you needed, as the Outlook Mail client, along with Internet Explorer, was built in. Of course, the TriPad and Clio weren't the only devices in the Jupyter line. One that reviewers preferred was IBM's WorkPad Z50 from 1999. It came in at a similar price, but used a traditional laptop form factor, complete with TrackPoint nub, instead of relying on a stylus. Otherwise, most Jupyter devices had the same hardware and storage limitations. Vadim tried to address this with a second revision of the Clio, which doubled the CPU speed to 168 MHz, and the RAM to 32 megabytes, along with bumping the built-in modem to 56K, up from 33.6. Ultimately, Jupyter devices never really took off. Other than a few niche cases where large companies developed specific workflows around them, their adoption as travel companions was hampered severely by a lack of software support. Plenty of people were still willing to carry regular Windows laptops around with them, so developers had little interest in rewriting their applications for, and dealing with the inherent limitations of, Windows CE. The Jupyter laptop revolution simply never came. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp, and as always, thanks for watching.